All right, class. So as you know, we're going to be coming up on a test. Um, expect your test on Wednesday. You're watching this lecture on Monday. And um, we're not going to do a traditional study guide. What I'm going to do is going to go through the book with you, hit some highlights, hit some high points, and have you complete the um, the reflection um, and and the uh, nine questions at the end of the chapter uh, as a as a recap for each of the three lessons within chapter seven. Now, with all that being said, um, don't don't fear, don't fret. All of the previous lessons, all right, from from before the uh, excuse me, from right after the uh, the last test that we took. That's what's on there. So go back and review. All right, go back and review. And I personally edited this test and made sure it didn't ask any ridiculous questions. Okay, I'm not trying to catch you or trick you. And remember, it's open book. So chill. It's open book. Doesn't matter if it takes you two hours to take the test. All right. Um, but needless to say, let's get started really quick. I'm going to try and do a quick 10 minute rundown, hit some highlights for you. So we're talking about expansion and reform, specifically the industrial revolution and the span and expansion and form, uh, reform of railroad systems, uh, and mill systems and industrialization in our nation, in our state of South Carolina, particularly. So that's chapter seven. You can see some, uh, beautiful photographs here. Uh, little girl working in a, um, looks like a cotton mill. And you can kind of see exactly uh, what is going on at this 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 time in our, our history. Uh, and, and feel free to look at these timelines and stuff like that as well. Uh, now, <clears throat> let's get right to the um, crux of the idea here. The Gilded Age, all right? The Gilded Age. Look at this. Right, right here on the left at the beginning of each lesson, it tells you the key things that you need to know about, okay? And, and we're going to try and navigate this chapter and help you a little bit when it comes to using a textbook in general. So key ideas, the growth of railroads, industry, and immigration, they fueled a second industrial revolution in the nation, which helped create a new South. Look at those words, new South, right, right, right here, new South. So then we've got bourbon Democrats, um, they hoped to recapture the, gl um, the glory of the state's antebellum past by undoing Reconstruction. So you've got people that want to essentially uh, keep the South the way that it was uh, before the Civil War. So they're trying to undo that Civil War Reconstruction. You can see right here. I'm loving this little highlight tool here. Hopefully you guys can see it. All right. So while Republicans ruled the White House during the Gilded Age, Democrats had influence in Congress and controlled South Carolina. So those Southern Democrats, and you're looking at them there, you know. Uh, remember, re the Republican Party is the party of Lincoln. All right. They're the party of change here, not the Democrats. Um in the Gilded Age, I know we talked about this before, um, how it was like in reference to a shiny new coating on the outside of something, even though the inside was still kind of the same. You know, just like um, a book might have gilded edged paper. Um, that doesn't mean what's on the inside of the book is still good. It might be beautiful, bound beautifully in leather and, and have gilded page edges, but it doesn't mean that the contents are beautiful. So let's look at some key vocabulary. When you think of this, look at corruption, disenfranchise, all right? That means to literally remove someone's ability to be a player in something, all right? Disenfranchise. In other words, they don't, no longer have a say in something, all right? Diversify. That speaks for itself. Entrepreneur, all right? All right? An entrepreneur is someone who takes what they got and makes something good out of it, all right? Some ingenuity. Industrialist. All right, industrialist, um, think of your Rockefeller and Carnegie, all right, people that uh, took the Industrial Revolution and made it into a monopoly for themselves. Labor union, all right, a labor union is where people have representation for a group of laborers, okay, labor, people of people that are providing labor, unionize, they come together to protect their rights. So we got mass production, it's where factories and things like that, uh, and then monopoly itself, a monopoly is where um, an, an, an individual or a company, you know, because a corporation can be viewed as an individual according to law, where they own all of the factors of production economically from the top to the bottom and left to right. Okay, monopoly. So if your company is Standard Oil and you own the oil fields and you own the pumps that pump the oil and you employ the workers that work the field and you own the railroad and the tankers that move the oil and then you own the oil field that the 
destination and the tanks where you store it, and then you own the ships where it gets put onto a ship and then shipped overseas, and you own the gas pumps and the refineries. In other words, you own all of it under one banner. Uh, therefore, you can charge whatever you want for your product because you own all of it. All right, that's what a monopoly is. Like, what's the key point in playing Monopoly? You want to own everything on the Monopoly board. That's what a monopoly is. All right? So hopefully that was enough to, to get you headed in the right direction. So railroads play a huge, 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 huge part in this, guys. Uh, let's look at railroads in South Carolina right here real fast. Much of the railroad in South Carolina and other southern states have been destroyed during the Civil War. And after the war, the federal government focused its attention on building the transcontinental railroads. As a result, the growth of railroads in South Carolina came slowly. Nevertheless, by the end of the century, the state could boast nearly 2,800 miles of tracks connecting most of our, our major towns and cities. So guys, railroad played a massive part. It did. Played a massive part. And steam engines, you can see one here. And it was transportation, and it was also able to... It was it was the 18-wheelers of, of the, the, the 19th century, okay? It's how stuff got from point A to point B, all right? Rise of big business. We got Andrew Carnegie here. And we've also got John D. Rockefeller. And these people are entrepreneurs or businessmen that were willing to take risks by investing in managing a new business. All right. Um, then you've also got industrialists. Okay. A company that eventually controlled the oil industry. So some of these wealthy industrialists, including Rockefeller and Carnegie, started out with nothing. They went from rags to riches. And they inspired many people who hoped to do the same. Kind of created that faux American dream. And faux means fake or phony. All right. Do you have a large labor pool to um, pull from here in the South and in the North? Let's talk about those working conditions. You know, we went from worried about slavery and how people were you know, treated on the plantation. Yet, look at these working conditions in mass production, industrialized facilities. Um, women and children are working. I mean, you've got kids that should be in the darn first grade, and here they are working in a factory for 12 or 18 hours a day and get their fingers chopped off on a machine because they don't know how to operate it properly. Um, it's not a beautiful time, okay? So yeah, you're working for a wage, at least you're getting paid, but you know, if you don't work at all, you're going to starve to death, and there's really no other place to work other than this dangerous facility, and no one's becoming educated. They're going to work as a child, and then continuing to work for the rest of their life. They're not having a chance to go to school like you guys do, even if it is virtually like we are here. All right, so Labor Unions New South, I highly encourage you to read this. But uh, the labor unions tried to help protect the laborer. Okay, you see some illustrations here. Um, let's look at it real quick. Uh, in 1883, it's a political cartoon. Oh, hey, I messed y'all up. Hold on. There we go. 1883, political cartoon called... If I can get it to work, I'm sorry, don't get sick on me. I know y'all getting seasick. The Tournament of Today, and it depicts the unequal um, contest uh, between business and labor. The lance reads, subsidized funded press, and the hammer represents a strike. So you can see that here. Why do you think the cartoonist feels that using the media was more powerful than striking? Well, you know, uh, the media is who was the whistleblower. Right, they could they could make change in these types of working scenarios by reporting it because you know what's more powerful than the truth? Nothing really, um, and so that's kind of what we're looking at here. Let's see, mills in South Carolina, you got a lot of them. You can see the workers here in 1880, um, right there at the very beginning of the Civil War. There was like a whopping. 14 mills and about 2,000 mill workers in South Carolina. By 1910, guys, 30 years. That's the same amount of time I've been alive. We go up to 167 mills and 47,000 mill workers in our state. So you have to think about it. Five of these years, none of that's happening because the Civil War goes from 1881 to 1880. Um, uh, 85. So you've got five years lost there. Really and truly, all this growth happened in the span of 25 years. All right. But you can expect to have low wages, poor pay, and terrible working conditions in these mills. 
All right. So Bourbon rule at noon on April 10th of 1877, the last of the federal troops overseeing Reconstruction uh, withdrew from the state house. All right. And then the Bourbons, uh, Bourbon Democrats um, had been part of the low country elite before the Civil War, and they sought to take power again. OK. So let's keep moving along. They disenfranchised African-Americans. It means to deprive someone of the right to vote or to do anything really uh, that they should have the right to do. But in this case, that's what we're talking about. Disenfranchised from being able to vote and participate in political processes. So the Democrats could do did everything that they could could do to ensure that they would that they would not regain the power that they had during Reconstruction. That's talking about African Americans. So the Democrats were against the African Americans and them to be able to participate in politics. Things like poll taxes, um, the eight box law, um, several other different things prevented them from voting. All right, because either they didn't have money, couldn't read or write. Um, it just it is un unbelievable. All right, some of the things that they had people doing right before election day, um, and a couple other things like the grandfather clause as well, which we still see to this day. So that's lesson one. Let's hop on into lesson two with the Tillman era. All right, farmers throughout the nation struggle with the effects of low prices and high debt during the Gilded Age. All right, a new national party known as the Populists, sought to address these concerns of farmers, but had mixed support in South Carolina. Ben Tillman transformed state government by securing a solid South for the Democratic Party. All right, Daddy was a veteran, a Southern Democrat. Ought to get a rich man to vote like that, just like the Psalm of the South sings, okay? So we got unhappy farmers. All right, you got concession, etiquette, exorbitant, uh, silo, temperance, and truck crop. Don't worry too much about those vocabulary words, but there they are for you. We do have a lot of farmers struggling at this time. All right. There's a couple different issues here. Competition and weather. All right, you got uh, competition is a huge thing. All right, you have large farms and small farms trying to compete with them. It's always hard to do. The little guy is going to struggle to beat Walmart. Does that make sense? American farmers had to compete on a world market, and farmers like farmers in Asia, South America, and Europe, they were all growing crops as well. Um, and you had to you know compete with them and ship it across the ocean. Some years the problem was not overproduction but devastating impact of mother nature's fury. So plagues like grasshoppers and army worms and the boll weevil could wipe out entire harvests leaving the farmers with nothing and extensive droughts and floods had the same effect destroying the crops. Remember things weren't automated. Look, you did this you worked the field by hand. All right, you didn't have a tractor with an engine that was pulling a plow. That's not how this worked back then. So they uh, they experienced a lot of difficulties during the um Gilded Age, and uh, unfortunately, farmers, you know, needed some help. So they began to organize, all right, and they created things like the Farmers Alliance, um, and they started uh, coming up with, like, group and community efforts, like uh, storage towers called silos, and the farmers would work together and store surplus crops there just in case, and then you had the Grange Movement um, and the Farmers Alliance, which were, like, unions for uh, farmers to try and represent them. So please, please, please take a chance to, to take an opportunity to read these before the test. Um, then in 1892, we have an important presidential election uh, that, that comes to pass. And uh, many farmers in South Carolina supported the goals of the Populist Party. Um, and they disliked that the party included African Americans, though. All right. So as, as a result, they withdrew they threw their support towards the Democrat Grover Cleveland in the 1892 election. So once again, the Democrats held fast to control of Southern politics. All right. Held fast to it. All right. So um, let's talk about the rise of uh, Ben Tillman real quick. Uh, he's here. He thought that farmers were to blame for a lot of South Carolina's problems. Um, he wanted to create a new university. Named it after um, uh, Mr. Clemson there in 1888. Uh, he was the, I guess, the executor of that man's estate, and he created an agricultural college and did away with a lot of the money that um, that a University of South Carolina had previously been receiving for agriculture, and they literally created their own. So Clemson had opened 
in 1893 as an all-white male military school with an enrollment of 446 students. In 1955, Clemson ceased to be a military school and began accepting female students. Eight years later, the school admitted its first African-American student, Harvey Gant, who later became the mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina. Today, the school boasts an enrollment of more than 15,000 students and is one of the nation's top 50 universities, especially in its agricultural programs. So, yeah, Ben Tillman, kind of a jerk, but hey, at least he created something cool. <laughs> All right. Of course, he served as governor. Um, we beat that to death. Um, South Carolina's new constitution. Um, after two terms as governor, Tillman made made it known that he wanted to be elected to U.S. Senate, and a lot of Tillmanites supported him, and he got his wish and served in the Senate in 1894. Okay. Let's see. After that, the constitution, of course, would be amended. And then you'd have popular elections for senators. But now we're going to talk about Jim Crow. Now, the rise of Jim Crow. Uh, real simple. Uh, the new state constitution set the stage for segregation by requiring separate schools for black and white. Basically, it was the separate but equal argument. Well, separate is not inherently equal. So uh, there was a ruling um, that's been titled Plessy v. Ferguson. Uh, that was a Supreme Court case. And it basically stated that separate but equal was okay. So uh, many southern states created these rules where you had colored only and white only um, things, all right, such as, you know, staircases, water fountains, uh, public transportation, you name it, there was segregation, all right, segregation means to be separated, all right. So we had our own black schools, um, you had these historically black colleges, is what they call them now, but at that time, that's what they that's what they were. Is they were they were colored schools, quote unquote. All right. So you've got um, uh, South. Uh, what is it? Um, SC State. Um, a couple other that were um, located there in Columbia. So you've got a lot of different um, black universities popping up uh, in order to meet the need for the African American population in our state, uh, which is a which is a great thing. And then they still go on and serve today. So that's lesson two. Knocked out. Let's hit three. Progressive movement. All right, so we got corruption in business. Um, progressive reformers work to address the nation's biggest problems. And a firm grip of Tillmanites on state government slowed the pace of progressive reform in South Carolina. So a little bit more of the same. Now you can see in this political cartoon from 1889, the bosses of the Senate, and it depicts these various um, industry monopolies looming over the Senate in the upper left corner, the door labeled People's Entrance is locked shut and marked closed. So the point is of this image, you got these what we call fat cats, these rich guys, and they are literally telling the government, that's the little guys here sitting in the Senate chambers, how to vote, how to behave, how, how to do everything um, when it comes to running the government. So these corporations were controlling the government more than the government itself. And the people certainly didn't have a say. So we got monopolizing industry, um, where these things become vertically and horizontally aligned, political machines, um, where they just help the same person or the same type of people to stay in power residually over and over and over and over again, instead of seeing any change or fresh ideas. Um, then we've got uh, progressive reforms that come in there. We have the initiative, uh, let citizens propose laws themselves by gaining enough signatures on a petition. Uh, then you have a referendum allowing citizens to vote for or against laws already passed. And a recall allowed citizens to remove an elected official from office if they did not like how he was doing his job. All right, now we see um, Teddy Roosevelt here in the bottom. Um, this guy, he did a great job um, promoting national parks. Um he helped create the modern idea of what a president should be um, with, a, with a progressive program called the Square Deal. He viewed this, the president of the United States as a steward or guardian of the people and believed that the president should guide and shape legislation. Roosevelt sought to control corporations, protect consumers, and promote environmental conservation. And he achieved many of these, and he even earned the title as a trust buster. So he broke up a lot of monopolies like Standard Oil and American, American Tobacco. So, you know... Depending on how you look at it, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was doing a good job. Uh, let's see. Woodrow Wilson, let's not get into him. Uh, 18th Amendment, uh, this is the banning of alcohol. All right.
right? The 21st unbanned it. <laughs> okay, so it's easy to remember. 18 banned it, made it illegal, and 21 made it legal again. 18 years old and 21 years old. Become an adult at 18, uh, 21 you can drink. All right. And that, that'll cover the, the dispensary stuff. Women's suffrage, uh, Seneca Falls Convention in New York in 1848, and Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, these women really were promoting women's suffrage long before, and it finally came to the South at the turn of the century. And you see women began to enjoy more rights, uh, although not really completely until the middle of the 20th century, truthfully. Uh, progressive black leaders, got Du Bois and Washington. Booker T. Washington's one of my faves. Love this guy. He was peaceful, but resolute and firm, and he believed that people should earn their position in life. Um, du Bois was a little bit more of a radical, and, uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't, he was not as afraid to, uh, to fight, so to speak. Uh, Washington, I think, was uh, a little bit more classy. <laughs> um, needless to say, uh, you can take a, take time to read this on page 244. It's a good read, a really good, really good read. So we have some reforms in South Carolina that take place. We address child labor and women's suffrage. And then right here at the very end, uh, you'll see chapter 7 review, lesson 1, 2, and 3, questions 1 through 9. These are what I want you to do for today's classwork. Uh, lesson 1 questions can be answered in, guess what, lesson 1 of chapter 7. Uh, lesson two questions can be answered in lesson two. Lesson three can be answered in lesson three. Go through, use this online textbook, answer them in complete sentences. You'll see them attached. Um, uh, you'll see them attached uh, right there in Google Classroom. Make sure you do a good job. Don't write 47 sentences per. Just give me a couple complete sentences answering each question. All right. Uh, and then start preparing and studying for that test on Wednesday, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Hope this helps. Have a great day. I hope uh, spring break treated you right. I really enjoyed it, planted my garden, and I've got some more videos to come for you guys, too, for entertainment purposes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, y'all take care, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.